I love worship, and I want to hold these two guys up here for a few minutes uh, because I want to highlight them too. Uh, One is... uh, this week was Jacob's three-year anniversary on staff here at the Bridge Church. Isn't that awesome? Yes. It is so good. And so I just wanted to publicly say thank you. Thank you for your leadership, your faithfulness, um, and just how watching you grow as an individual and a leader, disciple of Jesus, is pretty impactful. And then uh, while I was reflecting, just think about that as well. Um, this is Christy Clark. She's also my older sister. and uh, But she has been singing since day one that we started. And so um, it's so impactful to have both of you and your leadership and your faithfulness, uh, not just to Jesus, but also to the local church is inspiring. And um, it, I'm always get a smile on my face because I know we're serving together each and every week. So thank you guys so much for all that you do. Um, <laughs> Each and every week. And so, um, if you would, I would love to pray over them. Would you join me in prayer here this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for Jacob and Christy. Thank you for their lives. Thank you for what you have done in them. And that they're my brother and sister in Christ. But also, thank you for their leadership. And God, I pray that you would just continue to give them wisdom. Give them discernment, God. That you would grow them as disciples of Christ. But uh, also grow them as leaders, God. Give them uh, continued vision for the future. And what is next. And what you want to continue to do in them. And and through them uh, for this local body. And just for the low country and the world as a whole, God. Thank you for what you're doing. We love you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you for allowing me to single you out a little bit. I know you both love that. So um, today, if you're here, maybe for the first time or haven't joined us in a few weeks, uh, we started a brand new series last week on the book of? Revelation, that is right. And if you're here for the first time, you're like, oh, no, what? Um, That's okay. It is a wonderful, beautiful, inspiring, confusing, engaging, all of the above books, okay? And so today is uh, a little bit maybe more direct. You know, we can read through it and pick through and go, okay, I can see this here. I can see that there. And I just want to highlight next week because I'm pretty excited. Next week, today we're in chapters 2 and 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. But next week, we're going to be talking about the throne in heaven. The throne in heaven. It's one of our first views. In fact, I love this. It says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. That's good, right? And so that's next week. But today, we're in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And we're going to dive in here in just a few minutes. We're actually going to read some of the bookends, the beginning of Revelation 2, and then the end of Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to talk about a few things here in between. Uh, But before we dive in, I I begin to think about this. If you remember last week, the book of Revelation is a letter. And it's a letter written to the seven churches in Asia. And so uh, that's important for you and I to know because the letter is written uh, not directly to us, but it's written for us. And so there's going to be some things that were written to them that God said, I need to get this message to them, to this church, to this people group, so that they understand this. But it's going to speak to all Christians until the end of time. Uh, And I think that's important for us because sometimes uh, we'll open up the Bible and try to pull 2024 into it and and into the interpretation of what that looks like as well. Um, And so that's going to help us to understand what each chapter is about and what it looks like. Uh, But how many people in the room have ever been to the doctor before? Been to the doctor? Hopefully that's everybody, right? Like you've been to the doctor before and you've gotten a checkup where you go to the doctor, you sit in the waiting room, and then they call your name and you go back, they check your weight, they check your height, the nurse gets the blood pressure right, and then you sit on that, uh, uh, what's that, the little sheet thing that you sit on, and that's the loudest thing ever, right? It's just like paper, you sit in it, and then you wait for another like 45 minutes for the doctor to come in, and so you just, it's just you and your thoughts before cell phones, so I guess now we just scroll on our cell phone. But you wait on the doctor, and the doctor comes in, and they start to evaluate, right? They start to diagnose. They go, okay, let's check your blood pressure. You know, depending on who you are, they're like, yeah, this looks good. Or they're like, okay, you're like, you know, have you been on your medicine or what this looks like? And then sometimes they'll even do blood work. They'll check your blood work because you can't see everything on the outside. Or you may not have the symptom of it. But then they look at your blood work because they need to see what's going on internally. And they may go, oh, yeah, 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 this is good good job here you've been exercising I can tell right like and they they can say all that or they could go "Ooh, we need to take a look at this 
right? Like, we need to look at this, or uh, we need to d- uh, prescribe this medicine, or you need to do this, right? Because we got to fix this area, or this one thing right here. And when I think about uh, getting a checkup or having the doctor kind of look through some of that, when we read Revelations chapter 2 and 3, it's like Jesus walks in and he begins to do a spiritual checkup on the churches. He's doing a spiritual checkup on the seven churches in Asia specifically, but the principles can still lay over into our world today and teach us the picture of what God views as healthy and spiritually healthy and then what God goes we need to we need to look at this area we need to change this or we need to do this or I see this in your church and and so for you and I when we read this we're not only looking at it as an individual of what God wants to do in our heart but we're also as a local body like you're a part of the bridge church I'm a part of the bridge church and so we're looking as a church and reading this going okay God because when you go to the doctor what do they want they well hopefully they want you to be healthy right they want you to be healthy that's the goal and so when we look Look at this. Jesus is going, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be spiritually healthy in my eyes. And so when God looks at us, he's saying, this is it. And so that's why we see things that are going, okay, yes, this is good. Lean more into this. But then sometimes we need the, hey, we need to fix this, right? This has got to change. This has got to do this. Or this is going to happen. And so Jesus does that with a lot of these churches that we're going to look at here in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He's writing these letters. And if you remember, most of the people who received this letter at the beginning were facing severe persecution. Uh, some We read just about uh, 20 years before this letter was written, some of the main leaders were even executed and thrown into prison. And so they're a little fearful and they're some of them are running from their lives and some of them aren't sure what to do. And, and so they're receiving this letter for wisdom, direction, encouragement, guidance from God as well. And so as we dive into this, that's the lens that we're looking at it. And so I'm going to read Revelation uh, chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads like this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And as we read this, uh, you remember last week, uh, the book of Revelation loves imagery. And so a lot of times it's not just coming straight out, writing to the seven churches. Although we see that in chapter one, he's using imagery. The words to him who holds the seven lamps or the seven stars. He's talking about the seven churches. He holds them in his hand. And then I love this picture. Who walks among? It's Jesus walking among his church. He's walking among these seven churches. And he's talking about the global church as well. Through time, Jesus is walking in the midst of us and, and walking through this. And there's another picture where he's standing in the center and the seven lampstands are around him because Jesus is the center of the church. And the center of the local church and as he's standing there presenting that to you and I we're marked by that of what God wants to do in it as well and then there's a fascinating thing here when verse chapter 3 verse 1 everybody still doing okay Uh, verse 1 says here's to the angel in the church of Ephesus every time they write to one of these churches he's writing to the angel of that church. How fascinating is that? I, I love the idea that the churches have an angel, right? Like my, I picture our angels like real muscular. It's got like a sword on the back and he's like, yeah, you know, but uh, I, I love that. And anytime you see the word angel, it means messenger. But anytime in the book of Revelation, you see the word angel is talking about the heavenly being angel. And so we can uh, naturally assume that they're talking about the angels writing through them to get this church a message here. But every time he Pins a letter to a different church, he almost points out a picture of who Jesus is. And I want to read a few of these. He uses seven different terms to refer to himself, Jesus, in a, in a couple different ways. And it says, uh, we just read one, to him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And then he also says this, the words of the first and the last, who died and came back to life. The words of him who has a sharp two-edged sword. 
The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. And then the last one here, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. God's given us a picture at the beginning of each one of these letters of who He is, and we see that. I love the last one there, the Amen, right? Like it's the let it be so. That is who Jesus is. He is the center of all of that. And then he writes to the angel, he writes to the churches, and he begins to point out some things. All but two churches have a, this is an encouragement, this is what you're doing well, keep doing this, this is amazing. All but two have also a rebuke, a a redirect of going, hey, you need to repent of this, you need to be careful of this as well. And so we're going to look at both of those in each one. And honestly, I want to circle back and do a whole series just on the seven churches, So because we could easily do that. My notes just kept growing and growing and growing. And so uh, today we're going to talk about those and really end at the end of Revelation chapter 3. But the first church that he writes to is Ephesus. And Ephesus is a booming city. It's a port city. It is, it is uh, jiving. I mean, it's, it's like the up and coming spot. Thousands and thousands of people are there. Uh, people are moving there like crazy. The church is growing. I mean, it's a multiple thousand people church. And many believe that Timothy was the pastor of this church and then uh, he was killed in 70 AD and then John who wrote this uh, some believe he took over uh, until he passed away but um, we see this church in Ephesus this great start we're reading the book of Acts how it started with uh, just two people and the apostle Paul was there and it continued to grow and grow and grow Uh, but this is what the Lord says to them he says they have a strong devotion and service So their devotion is strong. They have so many, they have services. They're doing all these service projects and all of these different things. But this is what he says. He says, but they have forgotten their first love. They're so busy and everything is moving. Every, like from the outside, it looks like they are hustling. They are on it. They got this going. Here it is. This is what it looks like. But then Jesus goes, but you've forgotten your first love. You've you've forgotten What is the center of all of that hustle and bustle? What is the reason that you show up every single Sunday? You guys remember your first love? Like you remember the giddiness or like the I'm a little nervous and I'm unsure and what, you know, all of those feelings that come into it. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first, right? Like and with that, that love that you feel and you, you want to talk to them. You want to get to know them. You want to spend time with them. Like you want to know every detail about whatever you love, right? Because you, that's your devotion. That's your passion. That's your desire. And Jesus is going, you've, you've taken your eyes off your first love and your first love is Jesus and your devotion and your intimacy with him and he's saying that's the idea and he says when we do that a lot of times we'll grow strong in knowledge but then we'll grow cold in our compassion towards other people right we saw that in the Pharisees where they were so busy they had prayer tassels and all of these things they looked really spiritual on the outside but yet they grown cold right they're saying this is the all the religious acts that we're doing but they and Jesus points this out to him all the time he's going hey I'm right here like I'm the one you're praying to I'm God God, right here in front of you and you're missing it right and Jesus is talking to the Ephesus church about this and anytime we we read these so as we kind of walk through the next few my hope and desire is that we not just look at these like we're on a balcony so you know on a balcony you're standing there and you're overlooking everything and you kind of can uh we're up here like yeah that church is doing that yeah that church is doing that yeah yeah you know but I, I would recommend it's like you and I bringing a mirror And putting the mirror in front of us first, right? Us as individuals, us as a church. And before we kind of go out this way, because that's easier, right? But for you and I to go, okay, let's look in the mirror first. Let's look at our local church as a church and us as an individual first. And so when we look at that, it's going, what is our first love? 
And he calls them to repent. And he says, I want you to repent. I want you to kind of redo, go back, remember your first love. Or that Psalm 51 prayer that David prays. The return to me, the joy of my salvation, right? Get me back to the beginning. You remember maybe when you first got saved, you just had this fire. You didn't really care. You want to tell everybody about Jesus. Like, you need to come to church. You need to, I can't believe he would save a sinner like me. He can save you too. I promise. I know because because he saved me. And it's this joy of salvation that God has for us. And God is saying, do not forget your first love. Don't forget your first love, your devotion to Christ. But also that same thing. Don't forget your first love of others need to know about this as well. And, and don't get, let's not get busy and just and doing and this is happening, this is happening, this and going. No, but the center of it all is Jesus. And he remains that. And so the next church here is Smyrna. And this is the one, if I'm honest, <sighs> challenged me the most. Whew. This is one of the seven churches that did not get a rebuke, but only got encouragement. And so as I look at this, though, it challenges me and encourages me. But I look at this, is that they have remained faithful and spiritually rich during intense persecution. This church here in Smyrna, they were uh, a church that was not wealthy. In fact, we would probably label them as like a third world country church that is around and they don't have, some of them are, don't even have homes. They don't have enough food to eat at the end of the day. And it reminds me of taking a trip to Haiti and how they would set these, they called mud pies out. And they would make these pies out of mud and set them out and let the sun dry them. And then they would give them to the kids at school just so their bellies would be full. Because they were so hungry because there wasn't enough food. And we, this is the church of Smyrna. And Jesus leans in and he begins to tell them. He says, hey, you've remained faithful. Keep steady. Keep being at it. You, you can do this. I'm going to be with you. And he says, you're going to face, even in the face of poverty, even in the face of persecution, you're still worshiping me. And, he, and he's raising them up in this. And I want to read you uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And this is what Jesus says to him. He says, do not fear. Right, because they're they're facing persecution, and you're going to see they're going to get uh, continue to face persecution. And he says, "Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. But be faithful, even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life." And when I read that, I don't know about you, but that convicts me, right? Because all they have is Jesus. They have not, this world has given them nothing. It's just poverty and they have nothing, right? And in fact, Jesus doesn't go, okay, next year is going to be the best year you've ever experienced in your life. Here, here comes your blessing here. You know, like he doesn't, rally. no, he pulls them together and goes, it's going to get worse. In fact, some of you are going to be thrown into prison and the pressure is going to be on. And he's like, but you're going to have the crown of life. And all they have is Jesus and the promise of eternity. And they are still faithful. And they are still worshiping. And they are still placing their faith in Jesus. And I read that and I'm like, Daniel, what are you doing? Right? Like, why, what are you worried about? And I look at this and I'm going, okay, God. Yes, come what may. I want to be the ones right here, hands raised, saying Jesus is king. He is the one. And I'm going to continue to worship him through it all. And I believe that he was calling us. The visual picture that I get when I look at the church of Smyrna is a weary soul soldier you know somebody who's just giving it all laying it all on the line and God is just coming up next to them going hey I know it's tough here is strength and, and he's giving us the hope of of the, the hope of eternity and he's saying it's all he's saying it's not going to be easy but it's going to be worth it you got this. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm walking with you in this. The, the purpose and the mission that you have is still true, and it is still raining, and he kind of breathes some life and says, here we go. Let's, let's keep marking forward because you are the salt and the light to those who are with us. And so we see here in Smyrna, that's just the first two. This already, I'm like, right? And so as we, we get here to Pergamum, 
And as he begins to talk about Pergamum, we see that here in this city, uh, the Christians are uh, like 1% Christian, uh, if you were to say so to speak. You know, almost like modern day Russia or maybe South Korea or China or something of that nature where uh, you are the very much the minority. That would be this city that this church is located in. And, and, and this is the, what God says to them. Uh, they have stood strong in non-Christian culture. But he rebukes some of them. He says, some of you have started to worship false gods. And so this would be like if you and I walked out here and went into the marketplace, there would be literal statues of other gods and incense being burning and people worshiping the statues and other gods. And it would be visible, it would be out in culture. In fact, we would be the minority. You know, when we go to work or go to the marketplace or go to the store, like we would be complete minority in this. And so that is what this church is experiencing. And he is saying, yes. Yes, continue, remain strong in that. But he's saying some of you have, have, have given in to that. In fact, some of you have pulled in some of those teachings into the church. You've pulled in some of that worship from other gods and false gods, and you've allowed it because you are the minority, because you kind of feel that pressure. He's like, you've allowed some of it to come in. And he's saying what you need to do, what he says in all of these different churches, is the, the message is clear. He says, repent. I want you to, to let go of that and turn away. And anytime you and I hear the word repent, uh, I think we have a very negative connotation to it because maybe we uh, kind of grew up with the fire and brimstone. You need to repent, right? You got to turn from your ways and you hear that. But repentance is a beautiful thing. In fact, it's not just a one-time thing for salvation, but it should be a daily, a weekly practice for you and I. Because, I mean, I'm not going to superimpose myself onto you. But sometimes I pick things back up, right? Like I, I get lured back into things that, that I, do, I shouldn't be doing. And so I need to repent. I need to go, okay, God, I messed up. I fell short. I'm not doing what you called me to do. Here, I'm laying this back at your feet. I repent. And repent means to turn from that, right? And think about even an earthly relationship. How healthy is it for me to go, hey, Jacob, I messed up. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I need to turn from what I just did and try to reconcile that. And how healthy is that? If that never happens, then it's not going to be real healthy, right? But for you and I, in our relationship with God, this repentance is a healthy thing. It should be something that breathes life into us because many times when I pick up sins or pick up things that I shouldn't be doing that are against God, they start to weigh me down. In fact, the Bible says it brings along uh, spiritual death and relational and all these different things, right? It's, the early church saw sin as like a disease. Like, and they were like, oh, no, I got to repent. I got to let this go so that God can, can renew me and renew my mind and renew my heart and to help me in this of what that looks like. And so um, we see that he leads them to that. And so the next church that we have here, everybody doing okay? I'm not, look, I'm going to mess this pronunciation up because it looks one way, okay? We're going to put it on the screens, but uh, Thyatira, okay? It looks, it looks phonetically, I'm a phonetic speller, but I'm, I'm, I'll probably mess that up, okay? Full disclosure. Uh, but as God begins to talk about this church here, uh, they continue to grow in spiritual maturity, but they tolerate some false teachers in the church, and so they're growing in spiritual maturity. A lot of people have labeled this as like moral compromise. It, it's like they just kind of let it creep in a little bit. And I think about this illustration. A lot of times uh, we'll, we'll hear the teachings of Jesus or hear some scriptures or verses in the Bible and go, ooh, that's really good. That sounds really wise. Ooh, this can help me out. And I take it and I add it to my toolbox, right? Like look at my little cool tools. Look at my cool sayings that Jesus said. I'm going to carry it around and they can help me. When God's going, no, I am the Lord of your life. I'm the foundation of it all. I'm the foundation of life. And if you will follow me, I, I love you more than you can ever ask, think, or imagine. And I created you. I, I know how I created you to live at your best. And so if you will trust me and become the foundation of it all, right? But this, the church here, they were growing in spiritual maturity. He tells them, he's like, you're, you're staying steadfast. You're doing this. And he even labels uh, uh, Jezebel in there. 
and it's a different Jezebel than you see in the Old Testament, but kind of a similar spirit, so to speak, is that they allowed some of the false teaching to come in, and the people in the church just kind of took a step back and said, okay, yeah, come on in, yeah, teach that. It's you know another cool teaching, another good philosophy, and no, you know all those things. And Jesus steps in and he goes, no, look. Outside in the world, we may kind of talk about those things and bring in philosophy and those things. He says, but for the church, we need to stand on the word of God. We need to be, have Jesus Christ at the center of it all. And everything flows from who God is and who Jesus is. And, and other things, if, if they come alongside and support this, uh, the teachings of Jesus. But I know the center and the foundation of who I am and who the church is, is the teachings of Jesus, right? And so I, I lean in on that. We as a church, the Bridge Church, we say this is who we are. This is our foundation of who God is. And he says, if any Anytime you sense that coming into the church, it's our opportunity to go, okay, God, we've allowed this to come in. We want to turn from it. We want to release it back to you. We want to get back to the word of God. We want to get back to your teaching of what that looks like. And the next church, I can say this one, Sardis right here. And so the Sardis is the next church. And this one here, if you were to walk in on a Sunday, I mean, it is bumping. Things are going on. Music is going. This place is packed. I mean, if you were to look at their events page, you're like, look at that event. Look at that event. Look at look how much they're doing in the community. They're doing this and they're doing that. This is amazing. And they're hitting their growth goals year after year. Their budget is just doubling over and over again. They're like, wow, look at all of this happening. Look at all of this amazing activity, right? And they were known as being alive and active. That's what they were known for in the community. But Jesus looks in and he says, but you are spiritually dead. And he has a, a stark call for them. He's like, you got all of this going on, but you have forsaken your relationship with God. You've forsaken the spiritual side, right? Like you, you've brought in all of these different practices and you're seeing all of this begin to happen. And I begin to think about John chapter 15 where it says, remain in me and I in you for apart from me, you can do nothing. And I remember reading that for the first time as a young Christian going, no, I can do a lot of things, right? Like I can do a lot. And what he's talking about is, is the spiritual. He's going, you can do anything of spiritual significance outside of the Holy Spirit, outside of what God is doing in us. And so the salvations that we see, hearts surrendered to God, right? Like people breaking uh, addictions and, and different mindsets and ideas and traditions and all of these things. People laying those at the feet of Jesus and him Raising them up into a new life in Christ, that only happens through Jesus Christ, right? The promise of eternity in the relationship with God. He's saying, get back to that. And you want to know what the message is for them? Repent, right? He says, lay that down, get back to your first love. In fact, he says four things for this church here. He says, I want you to wake up spiritually wake up. It's like, don't just go through the motions, but wake up, strengthen what remains when you wake up. And then he says, remember what God is doing in you and through you. And then he says, repent, let, let those things go and return to God, return to his power, return to the power in prayer, the power in his word, right? Where, where the Ephesians chapter six, the spiritual armor of God, lean in, believe that God can still work. Work. And then we get here to Philadelphia. And this is another church that doesn't get a rebuke. Everybody still doing okay? This is another church that doesn't get a rebuke. And in fact, he uses terms like hold fast. And they were encouraged to remain strong. These are, this is a church here that uh, is continuing to grow as well. But it says they clung to the word of God. It was the foundation of everything they did. They held it close. They taught it. They studied it. They sought after God and everything that he has. And they saw just this resurgence of, of thousands of people coming to know Christ. For us in modern day times, it would be like South America. America or Southern Africa, where they're seeing hundreds of thousands of people come to know Christ. There are places like in Rwanda and South Africa, where now their countries are over 50% Christian, just because this massive move of God that is happening in some of these places, they're surrendering their lives to Christ. And, it's, and God is reaching down and looking at them going, yes, 
Hold fast. Hold on to that. Remain strong in that. I'm moving. I'm working. You're salt and light in this world. I'm going to keep working through you. And then we get to the last one. You guys ready for this one? Buckled in, leaned in, ready to go? Because uh, Laodicea, he doesn't have much good to say to this church. In fact, he leans in pretty heavy here. And uh, we're gonna, you're going to read here in a little bit of uh, Re- Revelation chapter 3. And this is probably one of the more quoted uh, verses in Revelation and even taught on of the lukewarm Christian. I'll spin you out of my mouth. This is the terminology that Jesus is using for his church. And it says they are spiritually complacent and indifferent. Right? Like it just... Whatever happens, right? Just indifferent. Like, I'm just complacent, come what may, just kind of going through the motions. Yeah, I'm going to sing this song, do this thing, kind of show up, leave. And and God kind of calls them out. And in fact, some have labeled this church as the church with Jesus on the outside. Because Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And they've left the door closed. And they're going on with their things and going on with their lives. And Jesus uses this terminology. He says, lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And many pastors have used the coffee thing. I love coffee. And it talks about lukewarm coffee. And you know how lukewarm coffee is like, ugh, it needs to be really hot or really cold, right? And there's no in between. I haven't made the jump to cold coffee yet. I'm still a hot coffee guy. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. And so, but the warm, he's like, the pick one. But if you look at this story, um, he's most likely talking geographically because in Laodicea there was two different towns on either side of the city and one had hot springs that were that was good for the body and people would go to the hot springs and and provide some relief for their bodies but then there was a city on this side of them that had springs of natural flowing cold water and people would go and get the best water and they would find nourishment they would find almost like this renewal of going ah fresh water and Jesus is standing they're going hey i need you to be either one like don't be indifferent because indifferent means you're not standing for anything right you're just kind of compromising here and compromising there and being indifferent and um kind of the old pastor in me maybe you've heard this before but it talks about maybe i'm just on the fence and they say the devil owns the fence Right, like uh, there is no in between. We just think there's an in between, but the, the enemy owns the fence, and he's going. I want you to be all in or all out, which is kind of hard to wrap our brains around, right? Of going, God's going. No, I want you to be all in, surrender to me, because a surrendered heart. Now, yes, now I can start to show you life. Now I can start to show you what's happening. And what was happening in this church is, is they were showing up. And being present, but yet just kind of being indifferent. They weren't met. There weren't. There were times in their culture when they weren't standing up, right? Or maybe there were some sins that started to creep into the church, and they just, well, you know, let's just let's just kind of let it go and let it be, and those different things. And and I feel this tension in our culture because we kind of uh, we love acceptance, right? It's kind of the currency now is acceptance for uh, everything, and kind of this erosion of absolute truth. And God's going, hey, sometimes there's going to be moments. Moments and times when we stand up for Jesus, stand up for the gospel, stand up for the truth. And when the, I call it when you turn the lights on, right? You turn the lights on, it's like, oh, people start to see like, oh no, I got to make a decision. You're shining things on my heart and my thinking and my way of life. And you're causing me to either go to this side or go to this side. And I don't, you know, we, especially American culture, don't you tell me what to do. Like, I want to be led, but don't lead me. You know what I'm saying? Kind of thing. And, and so as, as you're walking in that, you and I, as we're walking in Christ, Jesus is saying, I want you to be all in. And that's what he tells his church. He says, hey, church, I want you to, to not be indifferent, but I want you to be on fire for me. I want you to surrender it all so that I can lead you and direct you and and give you wisdom in this. And then I want to close here with Revelation chapter 3 and read a few verses for us because this is the call not only just to this church but for us and the other churches that we read about as well. Uh, But here in verse 19 it says, those whom I love I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I love that. Zealous and repent, right? He's using that word repent. Like, hey, it's going to be refreshing. It's going to be good for you to turn from that. Get back into the river of life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he 
with me. The one who conquers. He actually, you see that those words there at the end of almost every letter to the churches? The one who conquers. The one who overcomes. The one who conquers. The one who conquers. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And God is leaning in the same thing today. He's saying, hey... The, he who has ears, she who has ears, listen to what the Spirit of the Lord says. And he says this, and I, and I love this picture. And I want to close with three different uh, action points or ways of thinking. Because I know when you and I sit here and we read through all those seven, we're like, whew, that's a lot, right? Like there's all this list of things that were going on. And I think we could sum those seven things up into these three different ideas that we see over and over and over again in Scripture. And that is one is we need to be hungry for the knowledge of God. I'm hungry to know God more. That's why I'm in God's word, because I, I love him. I've not forsaken my first love. I'm going back to him. I'm not indifferent, because I'm actually seeking after God. I'm pursuing after him. We see that. And then it goes from head knowledge to it needs to start changing me, right? Like my heart, I should look different today than when you first met me as a Christian. I should be moving more towards Jesus. And he's shaping and molding my heart because I'm letting some things go. He's healing some things in me. He's showing me how to love. He's showing me how to forgive. He's showing me how to have compassion. He's showing me how to take further faith steps. And I'm seeing that change. And that comes from continual repentance, con continual seeking after after God. And then lastly, I'm living on mission, right? I'm not just, I'm not just growing in my head knowledge. I'm not just keeping it all to myself. In fact, I would think if you're changing is really hard because God calls us to live in the overflow. It's like, what can I tell you what God's been doing in my life? Can you show me? Can I show you how God has changed me? And I picture the mirror because you know, the balcony thing is we kind of get up here. I know I'm up here. So anyway, but like at the balcony up here and we're kind of talking to people, but it's like I bring the mirror and then I bring up somebody and I go, Hey, can I show you how God's changed my life? And I'm bringing them over to the mirror and I'm showing them all these things. I'm like, hey, they can do this in you too, right? Like they, they can do this in you too. And then all of this, God begins to move and work in us. But just like in Revelation 3, we have to open the door up and allow Christ to come in. He's going, I'm, I'm standing at the door. And you got to let me in. He's like, I'm not going to force my way in. In fact, I, I've, I've done all the work for you. I, I've died on the cross. I came back to life. I've fulfilled all of these prophecies. But you got to let me in. I think we open the door for salvation where we receive Christ, right, in our life. But then there's maybe some other doorways, like the back closet. We're like, Jesus, I don't want you to check that out, right? Like, I, I still, I'm still holding on to that. And God's standing at that door too going, hey, let, let me get in there. Let me start to untangle that. Let me start to peel that onion back because I want to heal that part of you. I want you to experience me fully, right? Not, not just for that, that moment of salvation and eternity, but, he's going, but I'll start to mold you and shape you now. But you got to let me in. you got to be willing to go, okay, God, <laughs> right? Like I'm opening the door and here you go. Here's my life. Here's that part of me. Oh, God, I don't know, right? And I'm Because I've been holding on to it my whole life. And God's like, hey, if you'll trust me with it. Look, look I'll open it one, one finger at a time. Like, you know, like, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's begin to heal. Let's begin to work this through. And as we continue to surrender that to God. And then we got to be careful, too, because I know, like, for me in my life, I'll let it go. And then, like, five years down the road, something will happen. And I'll, like... Let me just pick that thing back up, right? <laughs> like, like, this is a comfort for me. This is a sin for me. This is a, you know, something for me that I'm going to try to pick it back up. And God's going, hey, you know what you can do? I'm standing at the door again. Repent. Leave it at my feet. Trust me with it again. I'm going to take that from you again. And even though you may have strayed, like, just keep bringing it to me. I'll, I'm holding it again. I'll heal you again. I'll forgive you again. I'll walk with you again. I'll help you in that, right? But sometimes it takes that checkup. Of God showing up going, hey, this is good. This is good. Hey, let's, let's, let's get right here. Let's, let's work on this. And you're like, okay, God, thank you for not leaving me. 
Thank you for not allowing this just to build and build and build. And let me try to sweep it under the rug. And all it does is just create this big mound that I keep tripping over, right? Like, hey, guys, like, let's clean it out. Let's surrender it to God. And so today, I want to pray for us as a church. And as you're thinking about that, is, is it growing in, in my knowledge and hunger of God? Do I need to allow God to heal and change and take some faith steps in me? Or, or am I, am I, I need to take some faith steps. I need to, to trust God with some of those areas areas of my life and as I read those seven churches God what do you want to do in me and how can we live this out because you're a part of this church too we're all in this together and so I'm going to pray uh, the first doorway that God wants to open up in your life and in my life is the door of salvation he wants you to surrender your life to him and every single message in this revelation series I'm going to give a clear opportunity for you and anybody else that you bring to respond to the gospel because it is the saving grace it is everything hinges on this knowing who I am in Christ knowing my eternity is secure it is surrendering our lives to Christ and it all starts right there it starts right here in this moment so as we pray together as a church I want to pray with you if you want to surrender your life to Jesus here today, uh, I'd love to pray with you. And then I'm going to pray for our church as well. And then we're going to take communion together as a church. So let's pray together. And if you've never given your life to Christ before and you want to give your life to Jesus here this morning, you can repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I recognize that I have fallen short, that I have been running from you, God. Jesus, I ask that, that you would save me. I believe that you are God. I believe that you took my place on the cross, and I believe that you rose again, Jesus. God, and I pray that you would continue to change me. God, that you would continue to help me and guide me and give me wisdom. And if you prayed that prayer here this morning, there's a connect card in your seat. I would love to connect with you. Our church would love to walk with you. You're not meant to walk this journey alone. Just simply fill that out. Drop it in the offering box or the Connect Center in the back. But I want to pray for us as a church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you have done for us, Jesus. I pray that as we read this book and read the letters to the church, that it would, uh, God, that it would encourage us to know that we are not alone for centuries and thousands of years, God. There have been faithful followers who have faced the utmost extreme persecution, God, and they remain faithful. They had ups, they had downs, they needed encouragement, they needed help, God, but they still continued to worship you, God. Help us to do the same. Help us to worship you, to hold you up high, God. I pray that uh, for all of us, if there's anything in us, God, that we need to turn from, we need to lay at your feet, that we've let linger too long in our mind and in our heart and in our soul, God. I pray that you would take that right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would start the process of healing. I pray that you would start the process of us moving to be more like you, God. Help us to worship and to praise you through it all. God, give us strength when we don't have enough. Give us peace when we are weary and everything is running thin, God. Surround us with other people who would encourage us and to help us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said...